I have a deep passion for for constant growth. And to me, what makes me me is and I think innovation can increase a factor of a hundred if we truly collaborated, just we're open, just we're more vulnerable, op open to to truly open collaboration on an economic front, especially, and that's where the open source economy comes in. So I I believe that the Next economy is the open source economy. That's a deep conviction I get from my personal life where back in my PhD program I couldn't communicate openly and I thought, well, it's, this is so wasteful if we can't really communicate openly because we so-called have hot material that's proprietary to us. Um, that's, people think that increases innovation, but the truth is quite the opposite. And I think anybody who studies how things work, it's uh, I think we come to conclusions that the economic system is very inefficient. This monopoly capitalism is not the most innovative thing. I don't see any evidence that supports that an inefficient system can be perpetuated forever. And I think we see evidence where little, little by little, things are becoming more efficient in general. So I just have a deep conviction that it's just the way things are going, and an inherent part of that is open source. Well, I was always, first of all, considering, well, how do I do good, great things with science? Because science and knowledge is so powerful, we can do anything. So at one point, particularly in the graduate program, second year, I, st I started basically a lifestyle engineering course, just basically yoga, breathing, meditation, and Indian cooking from a one particular guy. And based on that, I totally tuned into a different wavelength. Uh, so I, I got a chance to, to, to check into what really matters at that point. And I think I was prepared for that in a couple of previous incidents, two chances in my life to, to, uh, to almost lose my life, so, which means that I had a chance to look, look closely at what matters. One was I was in a fire that killed 16 people, and two, I, I was hit by a car. So later I was hospitalized. And in these incidences, I was thinking deeply, wow, okay, what's really meaningful? You know, what really matters? Out of that, and then especially as I was thinking, like I was always set for thinking, what are the important things in life? And then that connect, I connected to regarding the open source economy, those notions of open collaboration. Open source ecology is currently building the Global Village construction set, which is a set of the 50 most important machines that it takes to build a small civilization with modern comforts. It's essentially a Lego set for life-size tools that are able to create infrastructures. So applications are, and a lot of people talk about third world development, for me it's about a development of any depressed economy or, or basically creating any community from scratch, a, a community that, that's based on its own resources and creativity as much as possible because the basic concept is the technology exists to live completely from local resources namely sun, sun, rocks, plants, water of any location which has huge implications on how our politics and geopolitics look because right now we tend to steal from others <laughs> to get our resources this is an option that's totally realistic, but people are not really awake to that option. And we're trying to say, okay, here's an experiment that will show. Can we get a community built using open source technology that achieves modern standards of living with local resources at two hours of labor per day? So that we can focus perhaps on some other things that might emerge after that. The practicality lies in the fact that we're developing, t we're taking industry standard tools and creating open source high performance counterparts that cost less while retaining the same performance. 140 mile per gallon cars. That's a new collaboration we just got into that we're open sourcing, actually building one of these cars right now, which I intend to be the last car I ever buy because it's designed for modularity and disassembly such that I can maintain any part of it. So the point being that we're talking about real powerful tools that apply not only in the developing world, but here, one is the actual tools themselves, everything from tractors to bread ovens to circuit makers, things like that. Also to, to the tools of fabrication that are used to build just about anything. 
So it's a very generative set. And I think there's notions that, oh, well, you're open sourcing this or it's more DIY style. It can't be that good. But that's a misconception because the fact is if enough people get around a project to develop it, it actually tends to exceed the, the competition after a certain amount of time. So we're just using proven techniques. We're not inventing any new technologies, really. We're just taking what's been there and open sourcing it. The great shift will be in a mindset. The, the greatest stopping block for block in the way of adoption of our stuff is that people don't believe that you can do anything outside of the mainstream industrial system. However, if one studies that question more carefully, um, I guess for anyone who wants to read a book about it, it's, it's called The Second Industrial Divide by Michael J. Piore from MIT. But he's basically proposed that the centralized means of production of today are not necessarily the only way that are feasible, but it happened for certain political and economic forces. An alternatively competitive method of doing production is known as flexible fabrication, which means that you have more generalized tools and higher skilled people to produce things on a smaller scale without needing so much capitalization, it lends itself to much more local production, and now you add open source on top of that, and you talk about access to state-of-art blueprints for just about anything, and that's a system that can work. So some people are calling this Industry 2.0, concept of freely downloadable designs implemented in real life in a local community by flexible and digital fabrication. So right now, the unique feature that we have in a productive system is that a, a small shop with advanced state-of-art equipment can produce the same kind of quality in, in smaller number as the largest of, of industrial conglomerates and take people building 114 mile per gallon cars in their garages where formerly that was feasible only by multi-billion billion dollar corporations. So there is hope. Definitely the showcase number one example is Team Wikispeed. So for any of the readers, please look up Team Wikispeed, Joe Justice, his TEDx video on how he developed a 114 mile per gallon car in a three month time period to win the 10th place in the Automotive X Prize with a team of distributed volunteers from around the world at a budget of 100K about where the comp, you know, some of the competitors he was against had multi-million dollar budgets. So this is the power of open source development, agile, lean development occurring in a rapid time scale with volunteers. So there are examples. There's other examples of, of businesses that are open source, like, for example, DIY Drones, a company that makes a DIY drone airplanes. And they're able to survive, even though they publish their plans completely openly. It turns out that people contribute back to the project. They may make improvements, and their business model works. They, their price of the product is a little bit higher than what, because Chinese people have copied that. China, you know, China made their wares too. But because of their improved service and primacy and community, they're able to, to compete. Another one is MakerBot the 3D printer that's also completely open source. The blueprints come out with, a, with each device that's sold and simply because they have their business model and, and supply chain and everything and the primacy themselves, nobody can compete with them. So, so a lot of times it's, it simply boils down to the fact that it's just a business except it allows free enterprise. It means it doesn't monopolize it allows free competition. So that's basically getting to the roots of any economy. It's like we've, we forgot about free enterprise. It's all monopoly capitalism these days. But uh, when someone asks, well, how do you make money with it? Well, it's free enterprise. We promote what's called distributive enterprise. So what that means is that we want to develop enterprises whose core of the business model is to, rep is to help others replicate that same enterprise. Which means that if we're developing the, you know, a, a, an enterprise to produce the cars, 
we actually open source not only the car blueprints, but the blueprints of how to make that enterprise work. So in a distributive enterprise scenario, what, what that means is that there's going to be more economic agents, more people taking on these enterprises that are more locally run as opposed to run from, from a big conglomerate scenario. So I think the open source has a wide range of applicability, and it can ap apply to, to regular physical manufacturing products, or it can apply to services. It's basically that what's underlying that service is open sharing of information. So what I see happening is the quality going up, um, people being happier, communities being happier because there's more local economic activity going on. So it's just a totally different framework. It's hard to picture what it would look like because we are we are presently in this economy and it's hard to think outside the box but in one way you can just say take exactly the same enterprises but insert just totally open collaboration and a higher rate of innovation into that and see how it what comes out on the other side what we produce is open source if if a company like John Deere or somebody else wants to wants to compete with us, we say, go ahead, sir. You can use our designs. If ours are better, then then you can use them. If they're not, then you don't have anything to worry about. So let the free market, open competition, decide. So basically, what this does is takes people out of the the inefficient monopoly zone and, and puts them into back into free enterprise. So if somebody's into monopolies and power concentration, they're going to hate it, but we, we can still, since we're very inclusive, we say, hey, we don't have any enemies here. We're, we're just, we just produce open source enterprise plans and blueprints for a new civilization. If you think it's better, you can use it. Now, the caveat is I think that as things get more and more efficient, a lot of people will have to adopt these principles of, of increased innovation rates because they work economically. And I think there's a trend out there that a lot of physical product manufacturers, it's already in, in their consciousness that modularity, one of our very important principles, is already on their radar. What modularity means is that you can break a particular product into components and therefore apply a much more rapid same time, uh, contemporaneous development on all the components, which increases the development velocity significantly. So people can generate better and better products when they modularize them as much as possible. So that part is already known, and that's one of our core principles. This is open for a lot of the standard enterprise to learn from. How do you get rid of inefficiencies? I think open source has solved that.